Before we begin with these scary stories, make sure to hit that subscribe button if you are brand new, as we upload some of the best scary stories and true crime content that you're ever going to hear on YouTube. With that said, sit back, relax, and let's get started with these scary stories. My bus route was long, anywhere between one to two hours, and I was one of the last stops. It was on a really rural route, with lots of mountains, dirt roads, and hallways as well. Being a rural area, most of these hallways were long, windy roads that families and relatives lived on, and normally just one to two families of kids to be dropped off at the same points. This meant that if a particular family of kids didn't ride the bus that day, for whatever reason, that the bus driver could skip that hollow and save us anywhere from 5 to 30 minutes off the total route. How could this ever be a bad thing, right? Well, one particular hollow, about 5 miles long, had only two stops, two different families, but the second family lived at the furthest point. It was easily three to four miles past the first family's drop-off point, down a crooked, dead-end, single-lane dirt road. It was the worst part of the route each time. Now, on days the second family did not ride the bus, if the driver skipped driving all the way to the second family's house, then it would save a 20-minute round trip, not to mention the stress of driving on the claustrophobic dirt road in a huge, hulking school bus. There were also times the family waited to pick up the kids in their own car at the first drop-off. That was to save the bus time and spare it the experience of driving that road. So of course, whenever they could, the driver would turn around at the first family's drop-off point. However, this was not as smooth of a turn as going the full way to a second family's house. This drop-off point was a small circular area with a couple of different driveways sprawling off only one of which was large enough for a school bus to fit in, and definitely not big enough for a bus to do a 360 turn in one swoop. But with the help of the one larger driveway, a three-point turn could get us out of there easy peasy. At most, the bus needed two meters of this driveway space, and hardly 30 seconds of its time. We do this happily for as long as I can remember, until either new residents moved in, or the existing residents of the trailer in this driveway, about 20 meters away, lost their minds. Suddenly, there's a large red farm gate at the extreme end of the driveway. No possible way for the bus to turn around when it's closed. For the first few months, whenever we could cut this route short by turning there, the driver would stop the bus during the three-point turn, open the gate, barely reverse into the driveway, pull out, stop the bus again, close the gate back exactly as it was, and get back on the bus, and carry on saving us all 20 minutes of needless driving. Keep in mind, this only happened when the second family either did not ride the bus or was being picked up at this point, aka not very often. Then one day, we turn up and there's now a lock on the gate. Huh? So, we drive the 20 minutes and carry on. Still, each time we have the chance to turn, the driver would check if it was unlocked. I did not know if it was ever requested to leave it unlocked, but I know from the driver's reactions, they wanted it to be. So, if it did happen to be unlocked, we would take the shortcut and the driver would put the gate back as it was. To my knowledge, no one ever complained about this. Then comes the day of the trap. We get to the first drop-off. The second family was not riding the bus that day. Nothing looks amiss, except, hey, what do you know, the gate is open. I can remember the smile on the driver's face as she puts the bus in reverse and begins the turn. At this point in the ride, it is just myself and three to four other kids only one being a grade above me, and I was barely six years old. Of course, I was chattering away with my friend and did not notice at first that we had stopped. Once I did start to look around, however, to my confusion, 
There was an assortment of ATVs, four-wheelers, side-by-sides, etc., and actual cars that had pulled out of the side driveways to surround the bus. Every single direction. To make it even more confusing, and thinking back, horrific, they all had an assortment of firearms. Yes, guns. Now, I'm six years old, and I grew up around guns. I wasn't scared by what I saw, but I also didn't realize I was being held hostage at gunpoint. All I remember is the feeling of profound confusion, of not being able to work out in A. Why are we sitting here? B. What are these people doing? And C. Why are the other kids crying? Maybe I was blissfully ignorant, but the driver told us to play in the floor and not look out the windows. So me being me, I propped my jacket up over the window in my seat and told everyone we could play under my row and I ended up having a great time, albeit slightly boring, time waiting. It went on for what felt like hours and I never looked out the windows during it, but I'm sure it was really only an hour at most, give or take, because our parents slowly started showing up looking for us. I remember two kids being allowed off before me. Then as I'm growing truly bored, my grandfather showed up to save me too. He came on the bus, spoke to the driver, and held my hand as we walked back to his truck, no one else saying a word, except my cheery goodbye to the driver. I remember all of the gang just staring her down as I walked away, and she never moved from her seat the entire ordeal. I don't know what happened after I left. It was only later that I grew up to realize the severity of the situation. I know for sure that my grandfather and parents called the school system, but I never heard of any punishment or follow-up either. The gate was never left open again, and we still had to drive that route each day, always driving it all the way through, except for those blissful days both families of kids did not ride and we could skip it all together. The same bus driver stayed on the route. She was honestly an angel to remain so calm and collected throughout all of it. TLDR, it was possible to shorten my bus route by at least 20 minutes using a personal driveway to do a three-point turn. This was never a problem until one day the driveway had a gate put up and was occasionally locked. Whenever it was unlocked, we would still use it until one day during the turn, the bus was surrounded and taken hostage by rednecks on ATVs with actual guns. This is a story my mom told me from when I was only two years old. My family has a small acreage in the Canadian prairies. It is not too far out from this city, but far enough that it was very rare to have unexpected visitors. At the time, we had some sheep and chickens, but it wasn't a huge farm. It was just my mom, my dad, my sister and I. My sister was five years older than me, so only seven at the time. We also had a sweet dog named Maggie. My parents have always said she was the best farm dog we ever had. She was some sort of Bouvier cross with shaggy black hair and was very sweet with animals and kids. She also never barked or got upset without a very good reason, much unlike our last pup, who, bless her soul, would bark at the wind. My dad was out of town this particular night, probably visiting my grandpa in his town down south. My mom was alone with us, just us little guys, and Maggie was sleeping soundly in the porch. My mom woke up in the middle of the night to Maggie growling. My mom's a pretty light sleeper, so it doesn't take much to wake her, but this was very unusual behavior for our pup. My mom thought it was most likely an animal, so she took a peek outside. Sometimes coyotes or large bucks would upset Maggie, so that was most likely the explanation. However, this wasn't the case that night. Our farm is right adjacent to the highway, and there is a long unlit lane that leads into our yard. 
It wasn't obvious at first, but my mom saw a dark vehicle slowly creeping down the lane. The car's headlights were shut off, and we didn't have a lot of light in the yard. My mom's stomach now immediately sunk. Anyone with good intentions wouldn't shut off their headlights. She also had two little kids in the house that she had to protect. She watched them slowly creep into the yard. I don't know how many there were, but at least a couple of guys got out of the vehicle and headed towards the shop where my dad keeps his tools, tractor, etc. At the time, there was a big power panel on the side that controlled all the electricity to the yard's lights and the house. And they opened it up and started to go through it, evidently trying to figure out how to shut off the power. God knows what their intentions were, but luckily my family has a hunting rifle and my mom grew up on a farm so she knows her way around a gun. So rifle in hand, she quietly propped open the door, just enough to stick the barrel out. She fired a few warning shots in the guy's direction. They freaked out and hopped back in their vehicle reversing all the way down the lane so that she couldn't see their license plate. I honestly have no idea what these guys' plans were. Maybe just to rob us. But the idea of people pulling into the yard with no headlights and shutting off the power is unsettling. Either way, I'm extremely grateful for our sweet Maggie and badass mom for keeping us safe. It's been 21 years since this happened, but I sure hope we don't meet those guys again. Sometime around the beginning of July, I got off the bus in Boise, Idaho. When you get off the bus in downtown Boise, you're already very near multiple shelters, the skate park, a miles long bike trail, the library, the zoo, and also the river slash woods. It's really a beautiful area, in spite of the overabundance of undesirable characters. The first night I was there, I went from the bus station to the skate park to a place called Piss Alley. At some point, a middle-aged lady pulled up and just randomly started talking to us for no reason. She wasn't a junkie, and she had a job, Yet she stood there in Piss Alley and talked to us for an hour about religion and conspiracy. I myself was high as hell for the first time in 10 months. A lot about her made me think she was some kind of undercover, but I ultimately decided she was just a little bit crazy. She had a job and a car and was capable of carrying on intelligent conversations. We really hit it off, even though we had just met. She asked me if I would like to go camping with her and one of her girlfriends the next day. She definitely seemed more appealing than the street thug I was talking to, so I agreed to go with them. They were going to be leaving in the afternoon, and so she said I could come with her now, or she could go get me later, after she picked up her friend from work. She took me out to eat, and we hung out at a park until her friend got off at work. They made sure they had a tent and sleeping bag for me, and we headed off to their favorite place to camp. Long story short, we went out there, we did camping things, we had fun, and we came back. Luckily, I didn't get chopped up into little pieces. Anyway, it was about 11pm when she dropped me back off at Piss Alley. As I was getting out, this tweaker with long dreads approached the vehicle. He was talking really fast. He said, I'm not on drugs. I don't have drugs. I got a couple of bucks, and I got a couple of friends, and we need a ride. We need a ride across town. We just need a ride real quick. I had barely shut my door by the time he finished his pitch. My lady friend looked like she wanted to give him a ride, but she told him that she couldn't. He didn't hesitate to reiterate that he had a couple of bucks, and he just needed a ride real quick. She was beating around the bush, explaining that her car was too full of camping gear and she couldn't even fit them in the car. One of his friends was a girl who looked to be about 15 years old, and they were definitely on drugs. I could tell because, well, 
So was I. He was starting to reword his pitch for a third time when I interrupted him. Being sure that I had his eye, I bluntly told him, Hey, no, she can't give you a ride. Then I waved her on and she pulled away from the curve, leaving him and I looking each other in the eyes. I could tell he was pissed off. I knew that in his mind I had disrespected him. Right away, he fired off. Who the hell are you? Is that your old lady? Are you from around here? Do you know who I am? I'm TK. Everybody around here knows me. You must be brand new around here. You ask some people. They tell you. I run shit around here. He went on to talk about how nobody messes with him and how he's got everything. He continued by saying that he's got shooters all over town and he can just make a phone call and get somebody to show up and kill for him. I'm pretty used to people saying stupid stuff like that and I didn't act scared or impressed. But I didn't scoff or mock either. I bought $20 worth of dope from him, thinking it might calm him down. He pulled out a big bag of dope. He gave me a tiny little piece of dope in the palm of my hand. We stared each other down and I asked him if he was serious. He yelled at me that what he gave me was all I would need. He was offended that I didn't trust him. A crowd had gathered, all of them staring at me with a look on their face that I knew meant they were waiting for me to make a wrong move. They all had his back. I now put my hand on my knife, but ultimately I just backed down. I then popped the shard into my mouth like some sort of pill and swallowed it. This was going very badly. I was seething. I could glare, but I knew if I expressed my anger with any major outburst, it would result in me getting stomped. TK and his main few friends walked away about 15 yards and stood talking in a small circle. After a few minutes, the 15-year-old girl came over to me and started flirting with me. I completely ignored her. This was obviously a trap. If he could make it look like I was disrespecting him any further and by so much as talking to his girl slash sister or whatever in front of all these people, he would gain more of their support. There were about 20 people in the alley now. I was starting to feel slightly paranoid that Shard was starting to kick in. If I was rude to this girl, that could be just as bad. So I answered a couple of her small talk questions with simple nods. She abruptly quit trying to be cute and walked back over to where TK and his friends were. He was on the phone. Next, a really big guy who might have been about 40 years old and another guy that might have been about 20 years old came up to me and started talking to me. The young kid didn't say anything at all the whole time. He stood there with a glazed overlook in his eyes like he was ready to kill. The older guy was a very tall fat man with a red goatee. He talked to me about very mundane things and went back and forth from being very nice to giving me the same stare that the young guy gave me. I could tell he was trying to see if I was scared and he was trying to see if I was an undercover cop. He was testing me in all kinds of ways, talking about crimes he had committed in the past and looking at me in a very intimidating, hateful way one second, then talking neutrally about the corner store in a cheerful manner the next second. The two of them talked to me, the one on each side of me, with my back to a wall. They were closer to me than they should have been. Everyone else in the alley seemed to be oblivious to us, but there were guys leaning against the wall at either end of the alleyway, just staring at us. I had three bags, one of which contained my laptop, I had cash on me and I was wearing a nice leather jacket. I kept my hand on my knife the entire time. I was trying to be respectful, but also not to look too scared. I was starting to suspect that the shard I had just swallowed was actually bath salt, because on the inside, I was tripping balls. TK walked over and set his bag down next to my bag and started going through his pocket like he was looking for something in his bag. I was trying to maintain eye contact with the big guy. Now I had to watch and make sure he wasn't going through my bag as well. I knew something was going to happen, and as soon as it did, 
I planned on flipping open my knife and sticking him swiftly and repeatedly. If I could, I would try to keep TK between me and the big guy while I stabbed him. I'm good with a knife, and I can also take hits. But if I had to fight right now, three on one would only be the first stage. There would be three or five more others rushing right after me. And the only thing that saved me is that I casually hinted that I needed to get some money from a lady who owed me. Without saying it directly, I led them to believe that I did not have any money on me, but would come back with some to buy more dope from them. And needless to say, I didn't plan on coming back. The rest of that night was very long, due to the effects of what I still believe was bath salts. I ran through the woods. I kept thinking I was being followed. I hid my bags in different places in the woods, so I could run without them if I had to. I was pretty scared, pretty sure I had narrowly escaped with my life. I was high as hell. I came across a guy on the nature trail. He had a cloth bag in his hand, and when I asked him what it was, he said it was just something he found on the trail, and then he threw it in the bushes. He was tweaked out, just like me. He seemed to sympathize as I told him the whole story of what had just happened. He was going to take me somewhere safe, a camp where I could lay low, but I was unfamiliar with the area. So we were walking and talking, and next thing I realized, we were heading right back to Piss Alley and were about a block away. I yelled at him, and I was like, what the hell are you doing? I said I didn't want to come back here. He was saying that it was cool. He knew those people I was talking about, and he could make everything okay by just telling them I was a good guy. I turned around and walked back into the woods. I went back to the area where he threw the bag. I found the bag and opened it. It was a big dildo. Still tripping balls, randomly stopping to hide, stopping and listening to sounds for extended periods of time to try and figure out what they are. I come across another guy. He's about 20 years old. In the end, he helped keep me safe. He took me to an island where the river split around a piece of land underneath a bridge. I fell asleep there, and I woke up in the middle of the night to a random couple putting a blanket over me. I said thank you, and went right back to sleep. After a couple of days of getting used to Boise, I found out that TK had made national news. The same night that I had made my interaction with him, the same night I'd stopped him from getting in that Christian lady's car, he had convinced a couple to let him sleep in their apartment. I can just imagine him telling them, just like he told us, I'm not on drugs. I don't have any drugs. At some point, he started acting really weird, cracked out. They had planned on having their three-year-old daughter's birthday party later that day, so they told him he had to leave, and he left. But then he came back and stabbed nine people, six kids, and three adults. One of those kids was the three-year-old whose birthday party it was. The people he was upset with weren't even there during the birthday party, but he stabbed those kids anyway. He killed a three-year-old at her birthday party. What a coward. Over the next five months, I got more acquainted with Boise and its Vargant slash junkie population. The people that had his back that night, most of them still missed him and acted like he never did anything wrong. When I went looking for details on his case just now, I found out he will be getting the needle, but that a psychiatrist had almost got him off the hook. He won't actually be tried by jury until 2020. That little girl is already dead. He should have been dead six months ago, right after it happened, or before it happened. I can't help but wonder if it was fate that put me in a position to have taken him out of commission just hours before this all happened. Yeah, I might have saved that lady from him getting in her car and doing who knows what, but maybe I was supposed to stab him to death in that confrontation that never fully escalated. I knew he was dangerous. I knew he was evil. But all I did was get myself out of danger. 
and look what happened. In the future, if I'm ever put in a situation like that, I honestly don't know that I won't consider taking action to be doing the world a favor. What if I failed fate? How am I supposed to sleep now? Hey guys, this is my second time posting on here, unfortunately. This happened a few years ago when I was 17 years old. I used to visit my brother and sister in Tempe, Arizona during school breaks because my town was incredibly boring. While they were at work, I'd go off and do some exploring on my own. One day, I decided to get on a bus and head to the mall. The bus I go on was called the Orbit. They're free, and they're small buses, like half the size of regular ones. It took two buses to get there, with a stop at the station in between. I went and did my shopping, and took the first bus back to the station. Whilst waiting for the second bus, I met this guy around my age, and we made a conversation. I asked him what bus I should take, because... I wasn't familiar with the streets, and he pointed me to the right one. I got on the bus, and the guy gets on as well, and we continue our conversation for a while until he gets off. I then put my earphones on and space out, watching the sun start to set. After a while, I realized that none of the streets look familiar to the ones I'd seen earlier, so I start to get a weird feeling in my stomach. I pick up a map that they have available and I notice I'm on the wrong bus. I get a little bit more nervous now, seeing how it was already getting dark, and to make matters worse, my phone was at 3%. Now I know the bus is going to circuit, so I just sit back and try to figure out what time I'll make it back to the station to see when I'll catch the right bus. As I'm reading the map. The last people on the bus get off, and the driver starts talking to me. Hey, he calls out from the front. Are you lost? I was a little thrown off, but I told him that I had gotten on the wrong bus. He said, okay, and then shortly after, he pulls into a really dark neighborhood and pulls over to the side of the road. I know buses usually have to pull over at stops for a bit if they're ahead of schedule, so I figured that's what the driver was currently doing. But instead, he gets up and starts to head towards me. He's a big man, around 6 foot, and maybe 200 pounds. He grabs a map, sits down right next to me, and starts asking me a lot of questions like, What bus are you supposed to be taking? Do you go to ASU? How old are you? I was trying to be courteous, but as our conversation kept on going, my heart was racing faster and faster. The last question he asked me made me start to tear up. Is anyone expecting you? I told him yes, my brother. He gets up and starts heading to the front. Finally, I thought, he gets to his seat, and instead of sitting down, he shuts the doors and turns off the light in the bus. So I'm sitting there, shaking and crying, in almost complete darkness, and I see the silhouette of his shadow head back to me and sit right next to me again. As soon as he sits down next to me, something in me snaps, and I jump up and run towards the doors of the bus as fast as I can, and I start banging and pushing on them until finally they open. I got out and ran as fast as I could to a store or a restaurant because my battery was completely drained. As I'm running, I hear him yell out behind me, and then I see him drive by super fast. Luckily, he didn't stop again. I ran for several blocks until I reached a cell phone store and burst in there crying and asking for a charger. From there, I called my brother and he came to pick me up. I was on the complete opposite side of town too. When my brother picked me up, I told him what happened and he said he was going to call the bus company and report the driver. I should have been more careful, but at the time I was just a naive teenager. Unfortunately, I don't know 
what happened to the driver, but I hope he got what's coming to him. So, creepy orbit driver, let's not meet ever again. I was maybe around 13 to 14 years old at the time, and I was recently granted the privilege of staying home alone. Every now and then, when I was home alone, I'd hear sounds coming from upstairs, and so I would instinctively call my mom. She then told me a story of how she used to hear things in her old house all the time, and how it's just the house settling in. Fast forward to many instances of sounds later, I decided that the very next time I was going to be home alone, I was going to be completely silent and make as little noise as possible. Within the first half an hour, there was nothing, not a peep out of the entire house. I eventually got bored and felt safe so I went to grab the TV remote to watch some TV, but a few seconds before I grabbed the remote, I heard a huge crash upstairs and running footsteps. I was sure more than ever now that someone was in the house. By now, there were plenty of consistent sounds coming from upstairs, but it was a fact that somebody was up there. 14-year-old me decided to hatch a quick plan. Being the skinny, most non-threatening little girl I was, I first grabbed a kitchen knife. Then, I grabbed a shoe and propped open the front door. And after a few moments of some deep breaths, I yelled out in the deepest voice I could muster, I know you are upstairs. I'm giving you a chance to leave without me calling the police, but I have propped the front door open and I will be in the bathroom. Be aware that I'm holding a knife, and if you refuse to leave, I will call the police. Sure enough, I walk into the bathroom with my knife, absolutely scared to death that someone will open the door. I wait, and I wait, until the one sound that to this day will always scare me for this reason. I heard the front door close, and the shoe was moved. I then quickly locked the door and turned on the alarm system. I hope to never see this person or even hear this person ever again. I lived in New Mexico for several years before moving to the Midwest. My friend Amy and I, both female, would spend many days exploring the remote corners of New Mexico, discovering abandoned ghost towns and enjoying the quiet, desolate beauty of the desert. One afternoon in March of 2010, we were traveling from Ridoso to Albuquerque, always up for exploring. We took a back road rather than exploring the more direct highway. One leg of our journey had us on NM55, it's a remote, teeny tiny two-lane highway. We loved those types of roads, up until that day. This part of New Mexico is flat and desolate desert. You can see for miles, and there is virtually nothing except dirt and rock between towns, and towns can be miles apart. So we were on NM55 going north. After a few minutes, we saw a white pickup truck up ahead of us going the same direction. Suddenly, he stopped his truck sideways in the middle of the highway, blocking both lanes. We were about a mile away from him, and as we got closer, we began to get uneasy. We could see no reason for him to do this. We were the only other vehicle out there, and we began wondering if we should turn around rather than come up to him and have stopped. We were about a half mile away from him when he pulled over to the opposite side of the highway, but his truck was still pointed the direction we were going. We tried to relax a little bit. Surely this guy was a rancher or something. Maybe he was checking something on his land. As we passed him, we noticed a few things. One, there was only one person in the truck, a middle-aged guy who never took his eyes off of us and two, he was talking into a walkie-talkie. A few seconds after we passed him, he pulled back onto the highway and started following us. 
but he never got too close. He would get to within a few car lengths and then drop back a little and then speed back up again to within a few car lengths. We were getting nervous. We realized how alone we really were. We had seen no other traffic on that road and we hadn't told anyone about our great idea to take this detour. We checked our cell phones and neither one had signal, typical for remote New Mexico, but scary given our current and present situation. Amy was driving and speeding up while I frantically checked the map hoping to find a road that would have more traffic. There were no other roads. We had to travel this one to get to the next town, Mountaineer. Turning around to go back the other way didn't seem like a good option. So after a few minutes, we saw another pickup truck coming towards us. He was going very, very slowly, maybe about 20 miles an hour, if that. This pickup was old and beat up, whereas the one behind us was a newer model. Amy had us up to 75 miles an hour, which wasn't typical for us on these 55 mile an hour highways, and we blew by the old pickup. As we passed it, we saw that it was another middle-aged guy, and he was talking into a walkie-talkie as well. After the white pickup passed him, he pulled a U-turn and pulled in behind it. As we watched all this happening, we could see the white pickup truck guy talking into his walkie-talkie. No doubt these two knew each other. We were being deliberately followed, and for the first and only time in my life, I felt hunted. They stayed right behind us. We watched for obstacles in the road. We truly thought old beat-up pickup guy had set up a trap in the road and our vehicle would be disabled somehow. We talked about driving into the fields. We were in an SUV, but this was obviously their territory, and we were afraid of what would happen if we went off-road and got cornered. So, we stayed on the highway. By now, white pickup truck guy was right on top of us. We could see him talking into the walkie-talkie, and he stayed right on our bumper. And old the beat-up pickup truck guy was right on top of him. The three of us sped down the highway. The white pickup inched closer. His maneuvering and edging closer made it apparent that he was trying to bump us. I watched helplessly as he got to within inches of our back bumper. Amy floored it. We were passing 80 miles an hour and edging up to 90 miles an hour. The road was flat and deserted, but any little thing going wrong would have been catastrophic. We absolutely were not going to slow down or stop if we could help it. The white pickup pulled into the opposite lane and started to now gain speed. The only thing we could think of was that he wanted to pass us and get in front of us. If he got in front of us and his buddy was behind us, then we'd be boxed in and trapped. We looked frantically at the rocky desert on both sides of us. Our only option was to off-road it. Should we risk it, however? Could we speed through the desert and make it a safety in one piece? As we topped a small incline, we saw a sign that said, Salinas Pueblo Missions National Monument, and it pointed towards a road on the left. And right at that moment, a blue pickup truck pulled out of that road and onto the highway in front of us. As we came up on the blue pickup, we saw the plate said, U.S. Park Service. We looked at each other and then looked behind us. Both pickup trucks did U-turns and went the other way. We followed the blue pickup to Mountain Air and then made our way to Albuquerque. I don't know exactly what those guys' intentions were, but they definitely were not good. There is something seriously wrong out there. So I notified the state police and they said that they would keep an eye on things. This area is very near Bellin, New Mexico, which is where Terra Calico was abducted. It's also about 100 miles from Elephant Butte, New Mexico, 
which is where David Parker Ray had his little secret torture laboratory. We didn't pull all that together until later. Now even though David Parker Ray had died by the time this happened to us, we do believe that there were others out there just like him, and whoever abducted Tara has never been caught. Or maybe we came into meth lab territory, but since this happened on an actual highway rather than a backcountry road, I tend to discount the meth lab theory. Whatever is going on out there, it's not good. So, let's not ever meet, or have anyone else ever meet these guys. This incident happened in the summer of 2015. I live by myself in a nice house inside a small town, low crime, but still the occasional shady person. Anyway, at work that day, on a smoke break, I watched a dog get thrown from a moving vehicle for a lane in city traffic during the start of rush hour. I ran right out there, scooped his little ass up, and booked it back to my workplace. He was not injured, amazingly. As a bleeding heart animal lover, I decided to take him home with me until I could figure out what to do with him. I have a large amount of cats, and always have. This was my very first experience with a dog that I was solely responsible for. This guy was very shy, head hung, tail tucked, jumpy, just looking at me like I was about to beat him. I was clueless on the subject of dog personalities and tendencies. I just knew they needed to be taken out frequently. His first night with me, we had been out about 15 times as I did not want him shitting in my house. I was having my final cigarette of the day on my porch around 10.30. The dog was in a lead, chilling under my chair as I smoked and poked about on Reddit. I see a man walking on the sidewalk that runs by my house. He kept glancing up at me before passing. Shortly after he passed my house, he stopped, turned on his heel, and approached. Hey, can you tell me where 302 Church Street is? He asked. I told him I would search the address on my phone, which of course was taking a minute to pull up. He explained he didn't have a phone of his own and was attempting to get to a friend's house, taking small steps toward me the whole time. Finally, the address I summoned came up. It's exactly two blocks north of here, right on the southwest corner of the cross street, I told him, pointing in the direction of where he needed to go. He kept his eyes locked on me, continuing to slowly move closer. Dog starts growling very softly at this point. I had forgotten he was even there until now. Mind if I take a look at the map? He grinned sheepishly. I'm bad with directions. I rose from my seat, pointing again. It's truly just two blocks up this road. Just follow the road. Two blocks. The house will be on your left, making it very clear that I wasn't going to just hand him my phone. Well, can I call them? I need to let them know I'm coming, he said, still creeping closer, extending his hand. No, I replied. How about text them? pushing forward still. Dude, no. I started toward my door. Just, just let me see your phone. He was visibly becoming pissed off, clearly trying to contain it and getting way too close to my porch. As a last ditch effort of getting this dude to go away, I say, you need to get the hell out of my yard. My dog is protective. He will mess you up. Hell, I didn't know the first thing about this dog, let alone whether he had the capacity to mess someone up. I just hoped saying so would intimidate pushy phone guy. Like I had said the magic words, dog springs into action, a la the wolf creature from the never ending story. He emerges like a bullet from under the chair, growling, snarling, barking his little ass off. He jerks me damn near off the porch, trying to get at this guy. He sounded and acted like an 80-pound attack dog, not a 40-pound timid beagle mix. I was afraid. I didn't know if the dog would turn on me. As stated previously, at the time, I knew absolutely jack shit about dogs. 
He backed his hind quarters into my legs, almost nudging me to the door. Still carrying on, eyes locked on phone dude and baring teeth. Phone dude holds up his hands and backs off, stammers something like, uh, two blocks north, yeah? And begins walking that way. I go inside, cut off my lights, and peek out the window at him. He glances at my house, assured I'm inside, turns, and begins walking the completely opposite direction that I pointed him in. Icing on the cake, he pulls a phone from his pocket and raises it to his ear to make a phone call. Dog secured his place as a member of my family that night. He is incredibly protective of me and has frightened away another creep since this incident. He is attached at my hip and has made it known that he is grateful to be in a safe, loving home wherein he will never again become a projectile from a moving vehicle. His name is Hank, and I truly believe that night would have ended very poorly for me, had he not been there for me. So when I was 15 years old, my mom was friends with a man who wanted to date her, Jake. My mom was not interested in a relationship with this man at all, and in fact was dating another guy, Colt. My family is full of pretty serious rednecks, and my mom is no exception. So one day, my mom invited Colt and his roommate, Frank, over to shoot some guns at our home range. We shot for a while, and eventually went in around dark. My mom and Colt got drunk after we went in. Frank cannot drive due to some brain damage, so... They ended up staying the night at the house. At around 2 in the morning, I was still up playing video games. Mom and Colt were in her room asleep when Frankie comes running down the hallway, saying a truck just pulled into the driveway. I look out the window and I see that it's Jake. Apparently, my mom hadn't texted him in a few hours and he's extremely possessive, so we went by to check and see if she was home. Keep in mind, Colt's ranger was parked in the driveway and is very obviously a guy's truck. Think spite lug nuts, spur hanging from rear view, skull hydro dip dash. Jake absolutely flips. He starts ringing the doorbell nonstop, beating on the door, walking around the house, beating on windows, screaming my mom's name, and circling Colt's truck. At this point, my mom and Colt are awake, and since we have blackout curtains, she tells us to keep the lights off and hide in the hallway, and if we don't do anything or respond, he'll think that no one's home and leave. Colt, being completely sober now, is understandably pissed, threatening to go out and deal with it. It is now important to point out the size difference between Colt and Jake. Colt is 5'5 five five and 125 pounds. Jake is 6'3 and 240 pounds. Jake could punt Colt 50 feet if he wanted to. Because of this, my mom forces Colt to stay inside. This went on for about 45 minutes. At one point, we see on the camera monitor in my mom's room that Jake has punched the side of Colt's truck. Then we hear the screen to one of the windows slide up. The window in question is locked, and Jake couldn't fit through anyway, thank God. It's at this point that I think of the only thing that will make Jake leave. I grab a gun, act terrified, which at this point I am, and walk to the living room and ask, Who the hell is it? out the window. Jake realizes it's me and asks where my mom is. I tell him she's out with her friends and that I haven't heard from her and I'll call him when she gets home if I'm awake. He says thank you and left. After all the stuff he did, that's all it took for him to leave and honestly, I was amazed. I genuinely thought I was going to have to shoot him. Later on that night, around 4, we hear his truck outside again. He squeals his tires down the road, obviously pissed that mom still hadn't called him. 
The next morning he's back again at 10, again beating on doors and windows, screaming and trying to get a reaction. Colt again tries to go out and handle it, but mom won't let him do so. He finally leaves again, and Colt does go out to look at his truck, where there's a three inch deep dent in the side of his bed. Colt is understandably pissed off and tells my mom to let him know if that creep comes back. Jake had beat on our doors until his hand bled. This also may have been from hitting the truck, but I don't know, and had blood on the doors and windows. My mom wouldn't let me call the police because she felt that it would just cause unnecessary strain and that she thought it was over. So the cops were unfortunately never involved. She was also worried he'd do worse if the police were called. My mom stopped talking to Jake after that, and I never felt comfortable in that house again after that night. But once I started driving, I didn't stay the night there very much, opting to visit during the day and go back to my dad's at night. So, Jake, let's not meet again. So, I'm going to tell y'all the story of the murder cabins. This happened back one summer when I was between 12 to 13 years old, before cell phones were common. My mother rented a cabin that we could stay at, about 4 hours north of our home. My father could not attend due to the fact he was working, but that was fine with him. We drove up to the cabin which was literally just a 15 by 15 room with an attached bathroom, just enough room for a bed, a table, and a small television. It was cute enough from the outside. There were several cookie cutter cabins you could rent, I think seven in total, that all arched around in a C shape with parking spots in front and at the front of the line of cabins was where the owner of the cabin stayed, the front desk area, if you will. Anyway, when we first arrived, we were the only people there. No other cabins had been rented out, even though it was August, and this area, although semi-remote, is a tourist destination. Northern Michigan, you know how that is. The gentleman that worked at the front desk and owned the cabins came out to greet us, I didn't pay too much attention due to the fact that I was 12 years old and excited for the fun outdoorsy adventures that my mother and I were going to have. Climbing the dunes, eating ice cream, swimming, having campfires, all the good stuff. Well, I remember him giving mom the keys and saying, the bathroom window is broken and does not close all the way, nor lock, which if we were the only people living there, why not give us a room in which the bathroom window was locked? We thought it was strange, but we kind of just shrugged it off. After a day of adventure, we went out, came back in at dusk, and went to bed. The next morning, Saturday, we woke up and went to get in the truck. It would not start, however. Strange, I will admit. At the time, it was a newer SUV, and I don't recall what was wrong with it, but I remember the owner of the cabins coming out and being like, Aw, your truck is broke? That's too bad. Let me call someone. Mom, however, insisted that she could call someone herself and went into his office, used his phone, and called someone to come fix it. As we were waiting for someone to get there, the owner came out and said, Did you guys have any problems with the power last night? Mom and I kind of shook our heads, confused. Oh well, sometimes in that cabin, the power will randomly go out. All you have to do is come out here and flip the breaker. He then proceeded to show my mother where the breaker was, which happened to be outside of the cabin, behind it, on a pole. After getting the truck fixed, Having another day of adventure, we came back, ready to settle in for the night. As we were sitting in bed watching television, the power went out. It didn't flicker, just boom, out. 
Mom now grabbed a flashlight that she had packed, and we went out there and turned the breaker back on. At this point, we were feeling incredibly uneasy, like anyone would be. We got back in bed, and about 10 minutes later, the power went out again. Mom jumped up and ran outside, only to see a man, which I assume was the owner because nobody else was out there, running away from the fuse box. We hightailed it out of there so fast. Luckily, everything had been packed because we were leaving the next day. But still, creepy cabin owner, let's not meet again. The police just left my home a couple of months ago while house sitting slash dog sitting for my parents. I had an eerie feeling. As an obsessive ID channel watcher and younger female, I played it off as paranoia. During these few days, whenever I took the dog out, he suddenly began sniffing areas he never sniffed before, particularly under each of our windows. And, thankfully, it's because of him that I discovered two larger footprints under a window that looks directly into our living slash dining room area. Around the same time, about two months ago, I noticed a man walking up and down our street that I'd never seen in the entirety of my life. It's a small midwestern town I live in. He also had, in my opinion, odd mannerisms, prolonged eye contact, continued staring and craning his neck as he walked by and never returned my smiles, hellos, or waves. Eventually, I became irritated due to how creeped out I was with both him and the eerie feeling in general and decided to wave upon no acknowledgement in return other than a cold stare. I got up and acted like I was going to follow him down the street, to which made him walk faster and turn a sudden corner. Never saw him again. Now today, I help my parents out by picking up their dog from the groomers as it's right up the street and a safe suburban area. Oftentimes I don't lock while running errands in town. When I returned home with the dog, I had an unexplained, horrible feeling the minute I walked in the door, something, maybe a blanket, seemed misplaced. Something was off. I threw a load of laundry on in the basement and I quickly stood up and looked around. No one there. Then I proceeded to the bathroom to check my makeup and right then I looked down to my left and there's feces in the toilet with no toilet paper and not flushed. I've been the only one home all morning so I immediately throw back the shower curtain and I start shaking. Adrenaline, maybe? And when nothing is there, I close the bathroom door and I lock myself inside. I call dispatch. They arrived in less than two minutes. Search the entire property. Make me check my laptop to see if any recent search history is into my own. Interesting. And check the fridge to see if food is missing. All valuables are accounted for. Now, I know this isn't my feces. No one in my family would have a bowel movement and not use toilet paper or flush. I know someone has been here. Yet, because I love horror movies and the ID channel, they think I'm crazy. But, hey dude, I now have my dad's hunting slash fillet knife on me. So... Let's not meet.